Uh, hi everyone, it's my, it's my great pleasure to introduce the next uh, plenary speaker, Professor Russell Luke from the University of Göttingen. And he's going to talk about variation analysis of random function iterations. Thank you. Um, sorry, that's not the title that I gave. It, it is still um, uh, random function iterations from deterministic to stochastic. Uh, okay. <clears throat> well, while, while he's correcting the volume, um, I want to say happy birthday, uh, Thank you, Alfredo, and it's a, it's a huge, huge honor to be here, my first time at IMPA. And in Göttingen, we're very proud of our math building, about the architecture in particular, about the open spaces and how the professors have to mix and mingle with the students, but, but this building is, is wonderful. I, I love this space, it's really great. Um, so, uh, and in fact, it was a, a, a paper of, of Alfredo together with Temu Penanen and, and Benar um, that really anticipated a lot of the things that have been bothering me for the last six to 10 years. Um, and in, in this paper, they, they focus on the proximal point algorithm uh, without monotonicity, which is, uh, and that won't, you won't see explicitly, I won't have time to go into um, that explicit characterization of things, but that's, that's basically uh, behind a lot of the constructs that, that I'm working with. And then also the, the inexact aspect of this, um, which is building on work that, that Benar had done together with Michael and, and uh, Alfredo also with Regina, on um, relative errors and, and uh, um, accounting for that in, in uh, these iterations. And so, so this, was a, this paper was a huge inspiration for, for my approach to things. So I'll start with the conclusion. Um, uh, and in general, I'm, I'm trying to solve a stochastic fixed point problem. And that's what, what this is the format of it. You have a Markov operator, and the object is to find a measure in the, uh, in the set of invariant measures for this Markov operator. An invariant measure is just something that when the operator acts, it's actually, so it's on the, on the left side, meaning actually the, the Markov operator um, acts on functions in the primal. The dual characteriz characterization is uh, how the adjoint of this acts on the, on the measure. But so a, a, an invariant measure is one that that you get back the measure when, when you act on it by the adjoint of the Markov operator. And I'm going to construct, oops, I'm going to construct the Markov operator from a random function iteration. And so you start with some uh, random variable, some distribution, and you apply uh, an operator, t, indexed by these xes. The xes are, are um, also random variables. Uh, on the, the previous iterate, and then you just generate this sequence, okay? Um, and there are two cases to, to that, that distinguish uh, very distinct kinds of behaviors that you'll observe for these types of iterations. As the, and, and they're based on whether or not these random operators with probability one have common fixed points. So if the probability that there's some point x in the fixed point of this operator is one. I call that the consistent case. So there, there exists a point for which this set is not empty. I call that the consistent case. Uh, otherwise, it's in inconsistent. And that's different, however, from the question of whether or not there exists an invariant measure for the corresponding Markov operator. But I'll, I'll come back to this. So, but uh, that's, that's sort of the the main setup here. And then the, the, what I'll tell you about is that for deterministic, so deterministic would be when uh, my random variable just takes a single value, and then I've got a Picard iteration here. So the deterministic case, uh, convergence analysis is only limited really by our ability to show metric subregularity. I'll, I'll define that later. Uh, and that, but, but the metric subregularity is necessary for error bounds. Uh, if you want to quantify how far you are from the solution. Metric subregularity, as I'll define it, um, it, it has manifestations and it shows up everywhere uh, in the work that I've done with Alex. It's, uh, 
it shows up as transversality or subtransversality of collections of sets. If you're dealing with optimization of functions, it's related to the Kurdikir-Loyosevich property. Um, so uh, when, I, when we go to the, uh, this is kind of recurring. Uh, when we go to the stochastic setting, then we you know, differentiate between whether or not we're dealing with consistent stochastic feasibility or inconsistent. And in the consistent case, you can get some quite strong um, results. Uh, if you just have a continuous mapping now, and your sequence of your random function iteration converges almost surely, then you have, an, you have a consistent feasibility problem. Um, if you add regularity to these operators, T, if, if they're alpha firmly non-expansive, so if you are familiar with firm non-expansiveness or av the averaging property, uh, that's what this refers to. I call it uh, alpha firmly non-expansive instead of averaging because we're in nonlinear spaces. And so <clears throat> um, uh, the, calling an operator averaged when there's no addition doesn't quite make sense, so I call it alpha firmly non-expansive. Then weak cluster points of the of the sequence are almost surely in this set C, and um, and then there's another result that that says if if the the sequence if the distance of the sequence to the uh, to the uh, the set the, the 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 fixed point set uh, converges to zero linearly, um, that's actually equivalent to metric subregularity in expectation of this. Thing. So, but in the inconsistent uh, case, we have um, it's harder. So the the results are a little bit more preliminary. Um, but we can show that uh, if we have a non-expansive operator, so Lipschitz with uh, Lipschitz constant one, um, then uh, for any initial distribution that you take from the the collection of, of probability distributions on R n. Uh, the sequence of distributions possesses weak cluster points. And if you increase the regularity of these operators and say they're alpha friendly non-expansive, then for any starting point, the iterates actually converge to an invariant probability measure. You get existence and, and convergence. And if the Markov operator is metrically subregular in some appropriate sense, then you also get linear convergence. So that's where we are with this theory. My, my motivation for this is, um, I'm not going to go into this too much, um, but just as more to convince you that, that I'm, I really do have a destination for this. In uh, X-ray imaging, uh, uh, particularly with synchrotron imaging, uh, they're building a, um, a particle accelerator up in, in um, Campinas, uh, and they'll be doing these kinds of experiments. They, 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 are, they take biological molecules and they uh, suspend them in, in some fluid. And then they drop, drop these molecules just in a, in a stream from some pipette. And they uh, blast this stream with uh, a very short pulse um, synchrotron radiation source, uh, X-ray source. Uh, that source is very high power, so it, it destroys the, the molecule. But before the molecule explodes, they get some picture. And uh, the picture is mostly noise, but a few of the photons are actually photons from scattering off of those molecules. Uh, and then we need from that data to reconstruct what was the molecule. Problem is, the molecules are rotating in any orientation in the fluid, so you don't know the rotation of the molecule. You get, you get just one, one image of uh, one picture of this, so, so the first problem is just a tomography problem. You know, you've got lots of different rotations, and you're only getting these two-dimensional views of, the, of a three-dimensional object. You want to put together the three-dimensional object. Um, so if it were just that, it would be a tomography problem. Uh, but it's complicated by the fact that you don't know the rotations. You have no idea. So you're just getting a bunch of pictures, a terabyte of pictures, and you need to find, uh, you need to sort those, put them together into some most probable orientation for all these images like this. Once you put all those together, you get the three-dimensional Fourier transform of the object. In principle, you just inverse Fourier transform that. You get the object. Well, except the, uh, the other problem is that you only have the amplitude of the Fourier transform. So you need to do a phase retrieval problem. But that's, that's the, the, the destination for all of this. But actually, 
Um, oh, and there's, you can apply this to infinite dimensional operator equations or distributed optimization. That's a more um, concrete application that, that people here would know more about than I. Uh, but actually, uh, I can motivate everything I'm doing by something that everybody teaches in, in first semester uh, linear, uh, linear, numerical linear algebra as a problem of solving AX equals B. I'm an optimizer, so I like to look at that as a feasibility problem. Uh, where you're just trying finding the intersection of the of the hyperplanes corresponding to the to the rows of a uh, multiplying by uh, x. Okay, so this is just an intersection of, of a bunch of of hyperplanes, and uh, then Roger would tell you, oh, let's just do alternating projections for this, right? Because uh, it's easy to compute the projection onto a hyperplane. We've got a closed form solution for this. Just just do it, and uh, so this this so now if I take my a x equals b, I'm just trying to solve a feasibility problem. Uh, this this algorithm would be cyclic projections, I'm going you know, projecting onto the hyperplanes, and then just do this forever and ever. And there's even a convergence theory for this. If a is full rank, then the cyclic projection converges either finitely or linearly to some point in the intersection. This was proved a long time ago. By, uh, actually, the, the convergence was von Neumann. The, the rates of convergence was uh, Aronsian or, or somebody else. But um, and there's beautiful theory. Okay, so then you tell your students, okay, implement this, do it. And we take a small matrix. This is it's. Uh, we have uh, more unknowns than equations, so it's there is not a unique solution to this. And the students will program this, and they get this. They say, oh, what's happening down there? And the Professor says, ah, well, um, well, uh, if we have vanishing errors, you know, because what this is, is, is this is numerical error, right? We have floating point double precision. Uh, so if we have vanishing errors, then, then we can adjust our, our convergence theory uh, for the exact infinite precision um, arithmetic and uh, show convergence. But that still doesn't explain this. And if you take, you take this, this wiggly stuff down here and you histogram it around, you know, the, the, and I'm looking at the, the um, take, this is a histogram of the, the residuals from one step to the next. Uh, and this is 10 to the minus 16. So you're getting something that, the, so the, the steps are kind of behaving like random variables with a distribution that looks like that. So, um, so the, the, the idea of you know, explaining error, computational error, uh, with some, some error that vanishes, um, it's, I mean, nobody increases their precision here. They just stop the algorithm right, right there, and they say, well, we've reached our numerical precision, and we're done. But what I want, what I want to build is, is, is a whole theory that says, no, we're converging to something. What we're converging to is we're converging to random variables with a distribution. And so, so that's. That's my motivation here. OK, so uh, set up. Got a random, fu so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look at my cyclic projections algorithm, for instance, as a random function iteration. So I start with some initial distribution. It can be a delta function starting at a fixed point that you have. And, and I apply, now here, this, this t, c, k, I can, now I can pick my hyperplanes at random. It doesn't really matter. Uh, and then get my next points. So this is my random function iteration. In general, t is just going to be a mapping on some metric space, a self-mapping on a metric space, uh, indexed by a set of indices. The set of indices does not have to be countable. It can be uncountable. Um, and c is an uh, i-valued random variable. So uh, what's a Markov chain? Just for those who, who uh, don't know, it's, a, it's, um, it's defined by this. It's where the, the probability that the next step in this, in this uh, sequence being an A, conditioned on all of the previous steps that I took, actually, it only really depends on the just uh, immediately previous step, OK? And so and then I can describe that through a, a, uh, a transition kernel. So this is a, a thing that maps. Uh, so the, the, the probability of my next iterate in this sequence being an egg conditioned on where I, where I was, 
um, is, is described by this uh, transition kernel from XK given this, this subset A. So that's just in general a, a Markov chain. So how do I uh, build this? Uh, how do I build this for random function iterations? Uh, my random function iteration is this. So I have a, a, a propagator from that maps my random variable x and also this random variable. So I've got two random variables involved in this, and it maps that to my next, the next point in my, in my Markov chain. And so then the kernel, the transition kernel, is described, is defined this way, uh, and it's just the probability that my next, uh, my next step is in this set A. So under this mapping, under this specific mapping T. Okay? So that's how I'm building my Markov chain. And this, this can be applied to uh, our deterministic uh, setting. So if you want to minimize two functions here, for instance, they, they can be non-smooth. So one of the functions can, can characterize our constraints. Um, you start with some, at some specific point, delta function centered at x naught. You've got an, your index set is just a single element. So this is not a very interesting random variable. And what my, what my uh, operator here is can be whatever your favorite algorithm is, either alternating prox or Douglas Ratchford, forward, backward, whatever you like. And then, then, then that's, that's your, your operator. And so this would be my random function iteration in this case. Uh, for for um, randomized algorithms, so maybe you want to solve a, a problem that looks like this. Uh, this was work with uh, former postdoc Yuri Malitsky. Um, we uh, these were for very large scale problems that that um, were, that split um, had a very specific um, um, uh, structure that allows us to completely separate uh, separate the problem. We we just choose these functions at random and compute the prox with respect to a single function at a time and do a primal dual algorithm for that um, uh, to help us deal with the fact that uh, there, the dimensionality here and there is, is very large. Uh, so this would help us to, to analyze the behavior of that algorithm. So what's a Markov operator? A uh, Markov operator acting on a measurable function uh, is defined this way. So here's the, the kernel for our Markov chain. And that's, that's the primal uh, action of the Markov operator on a function. Uh, the, the dual uh, action of it on a measure is, is this. So you've, it's, it's acting on this measure in this way. And there's, again, your, your, uh, your kernel for the Markov chain. So our, this is our stochastic fixed point problem. Just find some point uh, pi such that when I apply my Markov operator to this, I get that measure back. Um, so. Uh, it's this notation heavy. So each of the TIs, these are my individual mappings. These are usually going to be just on RM, from RN to RN. Uh, and then and I'll have lots of these, maybe uncountably many. So then if I think of uh, the, the collection of all of these, uh, that's what this, this, this uh, script T is going to be. And uh, this one will help me. I can then describe properties of this in terms of expectation uh, on this guy. Um, and so I'll, I'll have the probability measure on my index set, and the C is always an I valued random variable. My X's, and if I need another uh, random variable, it'll be Y. These will be all random variables on, uh, uh, with a probability distribution, given some specific probability distribution in the space, uh, or in the set of all probability distributions on RN. And all of my random variables, they are, they are independent of each other. So that's what this, this just means. So the x's are independent of y, and they're all independent of this guy. Um, so the Markov operator will always be denoted with this script p, with this transition kernel. Uh, I'll be assuming throughout that, that, the, that the set of invariant measures is non-empty and closed. Uh, and when we're talking about convergence of these things, it's going to be convergence with respect to a, a particular metric. And that's going to be the Wasserstein metric here, which is just the, the you, you've got two measures, mu and nu. And you look at the infimum over all possible couplings between these measures uh, of, this, of this object. And so this would be actually a Euclidean distance now, or not, well, Euclidean if that's Rn there. but um, 
so yeah. So and if the the um, random variables are, are independent, then then you can just you can do you can integrate along each uh, uh, each component separately. Uh, yes, and I'll use I'll use this this symbol psi or phi. I think it's psi psi um, to keep track of the residual. So this is the Wasserstein metric of my next point and my previous point, the distance between those two. And this S delta, this is just a fancy way of writing the delta ball with respect to the Wasserstein metric around some po uh, around the set of invariant uh, uh, of stationary measures. So I, I just imagine putting an, a, a delta ball around that, and this is, this is how I write that, and I use the S for that. OK, so abstract roadmap how I'm going to get convergence and what properties uh, I'm going to need. So let's, let's suppose that the, uh, the, the set of stationary measures is not empty. Uh, we have a fixed alpha. Alpha is always between 0 and 1, strictly. And some epsilon is a, going to be a violation uh, of the usual firm non-expansiveness inequality. So there's some delta. Uh, a delta ball that I can put around the, the set of invariant measures such that my T script T mapping, this, this guy over all the, all the uh, specific instances, uh, is alpha firmly, almost alpha firmly non-expansive in expectation with constant alpha, that should be alpha in there, and violation epsilon on this neighborhood. So this is a local, local property. And if this psi, the, the measure of the, the, uh, of the, the residual, is metrically subregular for 0, so 0 would be when I'm at the invariant measures, uh, outside of the set of, in, of stationary measures with some constant kappa, then, so if I have these two properties, then for any uh, measure close enough to the set of, of stationary measures, the iterates of this uh, converge to some point, say so they do converge to a point in this, uh, uh, stationary measures uh, re with respect to this metric, the Wasserstein metric, at a linear rate. And the linear rate is this, the constant of, of the rate is given by this. So, uh, and this is all with respect to the Wasserstein metric. And you see here that the, the violation, uh, so this thing is going to be less than one as long as I can balance out, or cancel out the violation of alpha firm non-expansiveness through the metric subregularity modulus associated with the residual mapping here. OK, I'll define these in a minute. But uh, this is like a meta theorem, because uh, that's the proof. It's, we're just applying the definitions. Th these are properties. They have definitions. They, they, they involve inequalities. So I, you know, the first step, you apply the definition of metric subregularity. Then you apply the definition of almost alpha firm non-expansiveness. You rearrange the inequality, and you get this in, oops, you get, oops, which way did I go? You get this inequality with that. So it's, it's, it's very formal. Uh, the easy part is proving this, this theorem. The hard part is showing that for your application, you, you satisfy those things. So it's, it's not super hard, but hardish to show uh, the alpha firm non-expansiveness. The really hard part is showing metric subregularity. But as I mentioned, the, the metric subregularity uh, pops up in so many different contexts. It has different names, Kodiko de Osevich, uh, uh, um, error bounds, uh, uh, subtransversality. Um, in fact, uh, I'll, I'll show a little bit later, um, the metric subregularity is, is necessary for a quantitative um, estimate of, of your convergence you know, for, for an error bound. So um, what are these things? What's alpha firm non-expansiveness? Um, on some subset of my my, my native set G, this, wherever you see G, replace it with Rn and you'll be fine. Um, and you've got a mapping uh, from that subset uh, into G. Uh, could be multi-valued. In the stochastic setting, I don't know how to deal with multi-valued mappings. So once I go to stochastic, I'll, I'll um, 
uh, assume that this is a single value mapping. But uh, so this mapping T is said to be pointwise, pointwise, almost alpha firmly non-expansive at this point on D, on D, whenever I satisfy this inequality, this nasty looking inequality for all. So now, what, the, the, how do you parse this? The important stuff, forget about this for a second. Get rid of that. You have 1 plus epsilon times d squared. What you have here is Lipschitz continuity of t. But it's one-sided Lipschitz continuity because I'm letting, we're, we're searching over all x in this set, but the x naught is staying fixed. So this is one-sided Lipschitz continuity, or if you like, calmness. Um, and the Lipschitz constant is 1 plus epsilon. The epsilon is a violation of non-expansiveness. Now you can pay attention to this stuff. This is a rewriting uh, uh, of the usual definition of the averaging property um, when you're on a space with, with linear structure. Um, I have to write it this way uh, because I want to go to measures and Riemannian manifolds and things like that. So uh, I need to get rid of anything that's, that's using addition. Uh, and also inner products. So, so this is a, the the this is equivalent uh, when you're in a uh, in a, a Euclidean space, equivalent to the uh, the other definitions. But this is the one you need when you want to go to more um, uh, unusual spaces. Um, and if the if the constant if this alpha is one half, then this is firm non-expansiveness. You might be familiar with. Okay. Um, and the pointwise allows me just to isolate this x naught. So that really is, it's like a strong calmness. Uh, and this is where, when I, I started with the, the paper of Alfredo and, and Benat and, and Temo, they were talking about um, uh, non monotone proximal point. The non monotonicity is coming from this property, from the, the, the allowing the epsilon there. So that's, that's where it's, it's hidden in here. And you can char characterize this in terms of non-monotonicity of the inverse of t, but I, I won't have time to go into that. Uh, so, so that's uh, non-expansiveness. Now, uh, um, OK, then I can do this in expectation. In the, the meta theorem that I showed you, uh, it was uh, almost non-expansive, uh, almost alpha firm non-expansiveness in expectation. So it's very similar, but now I'm taking expectations uh, over all of the, the, the t's that I have. So this, is, this would be the, the way to go from, this is sort of the, the um, in the space where the, where the mappings t are working uh, to then lifting it to, a, uh, to the, the stochastic setting. Formally, it all looks pretty much the same. And so, so I won't spend much time on that. What's metric subregularity? So we've got a general uh, multi-valued mapping from G to M, OK? Rm to Rm, if you like. Uh, and I'm localizing myself to some subset of G and also some subset in the image M, V of M. Uh, these are metric spaces, so this doesn't have to be a linear space, just with some metric DG, DG DM. So this mapping will be called uh, metrically regular with constant kappa on the graph. So this is, these are, this is in the graph of this mapping relative to some uh, slice of G, some subset of G. So uh, there's a big group, uh, Freire and Rene Henrion and others uh, are looking at um, directionally, a, a sort of a directional characterization of metric subregularity and things like this. Uh, this is kind of my, my approach to doing pretty much the same thing. But it basically says this, this nice property only needs to hold on, the, on this lambda subset, not not in the whole space. And that's quite convenient, actually, for a lot of applications. So we're metrically regular if the infimum over all z in the inverse image of y restricted to this, this lambda uh, of this distance is less than or equal to kappa. 
Now this is the distance in the image space of, of y to, to x, uh, the image of x uh, by psi. And so if this inequality holds for all x in d restricted to lambda and for all y in v, um, uh, and uh, right, so that's, that's your metric regularity. When this v consists of just a single point, y bar, let me just say that's metric subregularity. So this, this way of doing it was uh, um, really pushed by uh, uh, Alec Yoffe. So we're, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm resting on the shoulders of giants here. I'm a user of this theory, but all these guys have been developing the, 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 the theory behind this. Um, I, and uh, Alex Kruder and I and a, and a student, uh, Tao Nguyen, um, tried to show the relationship of this of this property to all of the other things that you see in the literature, the, the um, oh, there's so many of them. Uh, the the uh, KL. Uh, there's weak sharp property. There's the what was the one that, that Deutsch and and uh, Paul Seng? Uh, well, linear regularity, that was in the, in the set of, anyway, there, there are so many different names for this property. So, and in this paper, we kind of tried to put it all together. Okay, <clears throat> so recall our, our abstract convergence result. So we've got, we're, we're now working on the, on the Markov operator. The Markov operator is an operator on the space of measures. So this is why I need, I need to stay away from spaces with linear structure. Um, and so now we've got a almost, Alpha firmly non-expansive in expectation uh, mapping T uh, with all of these. That's an alpha uh, with all these with this violation on this ball around the uh, set of uh, stationary measures, and we got metric subregularity of the of the residual, the thing that's that's um, sort of metrizing the, the residual for me. Uh, then I have linear convergence and uh, with this rate as long as this is less than one. So, I mean, you're not guaranteed to have this. You have to, you have to know enough about these constants to be able to guarantee this. And so here's the, here's the, the uh, before I go to this, this detour, here's the trick. Uh, um, you, what you want to be able to do is you want to show that for any, you can always choose the ball small enough to make this violation as small as you need. Because if you can establish qualitatively that you're, that your fixed point mapping is metrically subregular. Sometimes you can do that. If you have polyhedral structure or something that you, you, you know you have metric subregularity, you don't know the constant. And calculating this constant is, is impossible, I think. Um, but if you know that you can choose your neighborhoods of, the, of your destination set, the, the, the set of um, stationary measures, uh, if you can choose that neighborhood small enough you can drive this epsilon as small as you need in order for this thing to be less than one. That's the whole game. So, and there's no way, I'm going to show you now, there's no way around metric subregularity here. So, um, in the deterministic case, uh, we, we say that a, a, a sequence is linearly monotone with respect to some set. If there's a constant in, in and including 0 and 1, uh, such that this inequality holds. And this is just on the sequence. Okay? You compare this to Feyer monotonicity. Feyer monotonicity um, is with respect to all points in here. Here, it's just the distance to the set. So if you're Feyer, you're linearly monotone, but not the other way around. Uh, in, the convex set you, in the convex world, you won't really care about this distinction. For the non-convex world, you definitely need that. Um, and so uh, what I showed together with Mark Tabul and, and Tao, uh, who was the joint student with, with Alex uh, on the other work, is that if you have a sequence, so you, you initiate uh, your, your fixed point sequence from any point in a ball around your fixed point set, possibly just restricted to this, this um, it's usually it's an affine subspace, uh, possibly restricted to there. Uh, so, if, so if for all starting points, you get a linearly monotone sequence with respect to the fixed point set with some constant strictly less than one, then that means that this residual operator is metrically subregular. So basically, the, the, the short answer is 
linear convergence of your sequence means metric subregularity of your fixed point mapping. Uh, so which means if you want to uh, show linear convergence, you have to show metric subregularity by whatever means you, you can, can devise. If in addition, so wh where does alpha firmly non-expansiveness come in, come in? This only tells you that the sequence, that the, the distance of the sequence is converging to the fixed point set. It doesn't say that it reaches the fixed point set. Alpha firm non-expansiveness gives you actual convergence. So that's the important thing there. And, so, and you see this in the convex theory, actually, too. You can, you can do the convex theory without, without uh, metric regularity or anything like that. Um, and the firm non-expansiveness gives, um, gives you convergence of the sequence, but not a rate. And if you want the rate, you've got to go to metrics of regularity. So uh, using these tools, these are some of the results that we've uh, been uh, churning out. Uh, uh, they're not all new, uh, but they, so some of them are six years old or something, but, but they were first. So uh, we could show that uh, um, inconsistent feasibility, if the sets are convex with empty intersection, you get global convergence. Um, if sparse affine feasibility, so one of the sets is affine, the other is a sparsity set. Uh, under appropriate assumptions, you can get global convergence of, of cyclic projections to this. Uh, rings, so you got you know, these circles. So, uh, circles are my favorite example. So the really surprising thing. So just circles, and you apply cyclic projections to this. You actually have linear convergence in that case. Uh, that's fine. We all know this is fine, because even though these are circles, from the outside, they look like balls, so that, that's fine. Um, <clears throat> so that was a kind of a surprising uh, result. And uh, that also then applies to phase retrieval, because phase retrieval basically amounts to a problem like that. Um, we also got linear convergence of Douglas Ratchford uh, under very strong assumptions, very nice intersection, and you need reasonable sets. When you go to non-convex, you have to start being much more precise about, because there are lots of ways to be non-convex, you have to be much more precise about the regularity of your set. Um, and another part of this, and, and also in the paper with, with Alex, we tried to categorize, sort of build a taxonomy of types of non-convexity that, that, that uh, fit into this uh, framework. Uh, relaxed Douglas Ratchard, the, the big challenge was we know that Douglas Ratchard doesn't converge in the inconsistent feasibility case. So you relax it, you just take the distance to one of the sets and, and project onto the other set. Uh, that converges linearly to uh, a fixed point of the relaxed operator uh, for inconsistent feasibility for non-tangential circles. So again, so if you applied relaxed Douglas Ratchford to something like this, you'll converge. You won't converge to a best approximation point. You're going to converge to some point outside of this, depending on your relaxation parameter lambda. I don't have time to go into that. But anyway, that's, that is new. This should be, if Patrick Combet doesn't sit on the paper for another six months, it should be accepted very soon. Uh, and then we also applied this to ADMM. It showed Q linear uh, convergence to that when you're dealing with problems where the objective is linear, piecewise linear quadratic, and you have linear equality constraints. So we didn't use any of the usual technology of strong convexity or strong monotonicity or anything like that. So that was, that was nice. OK. Uh, let's see. I started at 10 past? 10 minutes. Oh, I have 10 minutes. OK. I think I might be able to get through it. So that was all the, the deterministic um, dividends from this, this approach. So I'll show you what we've got for the stochastic case. So first, consistent. So here's our uh, random function iteration, uh, the kernel of the Markov chain. And this set is non-empty. So with probability 1, th 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 there are points such that with probability 1, I'll be in the fixed point set of all of my, all of my mappings t. Uh, so this was the nice uh, result uh, from my student uh, Neil Hammer, I, I didn't mention at the beginning, this is, this is all joint work with uh, Neil Hammer, a former PhD student of mine, and Anya Storm, who's the probabilist who I would never have trusted to get into this uh, without uh, uh, an expert <laughs> to keep me from saying stupid things. Uh, so if, if, you, if you're on a Polish space, so a Polish space, just a, a space that can be uh, uh, 
metrized with a, a, a complete separable uh, metric space. Um, and the TIs are continuous. So here, this is a very weak assumption. Uh, and uh, then, so what do I want to say? Uh, you've got some invariant measure in the, uh, in the uh, a stationary measure here. Um, and you start with some point that is distributed like that. And this point is, is independent of, of how we're going to choose these. If the corresponding random function iteration uh, converges uh, almost surely, then you, you are in the consistent case. Okay. So we have to assume that this, this thing is not empty. We're starting with some point that's, that's distributed. Uh, this doesn't make sense, though, because uh, then I'm there, and I would converge in one step almost surely. Uh, anyway, I, I think this is just if you start anywhere, actually. Uh, and because the point is that uh, almost sure convergence means consistent uh, stochastic feasibility. Something got mangled with that. Um, sorry. Uh, the other result we have is that um, if, if we add now, we up the, the um, regularity of these, these mappings to alpha firmly non-expansive. And uh, we could have an uncountable set, so I need to bound all of these away from one. Uh, then the weak cluster points of the sequence of random variables in a Hilbert space generated by the random function iteration are almost surely contained in, in the, the set C. And if the Hilbert space is separable, then we have weak convergence of the sequence, and the projection onto the, to the set C converges strongly. Uh, so you can apply this to the, um, to the randomized primal dual algorithm that I showed you at the beginning. Uh, and this has a fully separable structure. Uh, so, uh, so it's reasonable su to suppose that uh, there exist common fixed points, uh, common stationary points over all of these individual functions. Because it, they, it's, you've got the individual functions j, and, the, and they split into their blocks of variables that are independent from the other blocks. So we can use this to prove uh, convergence of this algorithm uh, almost surely to a, a fixed point. Um, and we can get rates on this. This is uh, inspired by an idea by Angela Nedic. Uh, she did this for when the t's were projection operators. But as I showed you, the t's can be your favorite algorithm, whatever it is. Um, and so we're going to define the, the psi mapping as the expectation of the residual here. Uh, and we'll say that, that this is met metrically regular in expectation if this thing is metrically regular for 0 at all x in here. And so we actually showed the, the same result that I showed you from, uh, with, with Mark Tabul and Tao Nguyen in the deterministic case that metrics of regularity is necessary for linear convergence of of your sequences, we have the same thing in the stochastic setting, that, that this, this guy is metrically regular in expectation if and only if uh, the, the sequence uh, converges linearly in expectation to, to the, the set C. OK. Uh, so now if we go to the inc inconsistent case, um, so here it's, it's um, the probabilists have a much better handle on things than, than I do, uh, and it's very difficult to come up with something that, that a probabilist wouldn't just look at it and say is totally trivial. Um, uh, uh, Sarek in 2006 uh, has this result that you're on a Polish space, and you have, if you have a non-expensive mapping uh, and the stationary measures, the set of stationary measures is not empty, then um, any subsequence. Now, but here's the trick. Uh, this is initialized by a delta function at s. What is s? s is some point in the support of the invariant uh, of, of a measure in the uh, set of invariant uh, measures. So you have to know the support of uh, the solutions that you're heading to. You might not know the distributions, but you have to know where those, where those are supported. So if you initialize, so this is the ergodic uh, result. If you initialize with a, some distribution that has that support, then this possesses cluster points in the weak sense uh, uh, for all s in the support 
of some invariant measure. So that is not very nice if you, um, uh, if you go, and this is very general, but if we say that the G, that our measure, or metric space is just the Euclidean space, Rn, then in fact, uh, for any point, for any probability, you can start with any probability measure, uh, then your sequence possesses weak uh, cluster points. So that's, that's the advantage of, of coming to this uh, simpler space, which we're, is, is sufficient for all of our applications. Um, if we up the regularity of these mappings to uh, uh, alpha firm, um, then for any initial distribution, you don't have to know anything about the support of these guys, the distributions of these iterates generated by the random function iteration converge, they actually converge to a point there. So we get, we get convergence. Um, and you can apply this now to, uh, uh, say, random uh, gradient descent. So here it's not separable. So we've got you know, a sum of convex functions, uh, Lipschitz continuous gradient. This is, these are the usual assumptions uh, for these kinds of things. Um, this capital F, uh, the expectation of these, um, it's, it's bounded below. Uh, and it has a, we've got some point where, where it achieves its minimum. Uh, and if, if this is strongly convex, then what our, our T mappings are, these are just the going in the direction of steepest descent with respect to just one of these guys. And in some fixed step, step length. We don't have to play with the step lengths. I, I don't like algorithms that require tuning parameters because I don't have enough time to fiddle around with parameters. Um, and so if... Uh, so we have to satisfy this. It just basically says that all of these guys are bounded below. Um, then there exists an invariant measure for the stochastic gradient descent method with fixed step size. And the sequence of random variables converges in distribution from any starting point. And if you then add metric subregularity, you can get linear convergence in the Wasserstein metric. So uh, we can also then apply this to inconsistent feasibility, uh, so trying to find the intersection of sets when they don't intersect, uh, and these sets are convex, then <clears throat> we get that uh, uh, as long as, as there exist um, stationary measures, then the Cesaro average of the distributions converges to a point uh, in, the, uh, in this set, and again, under metric subregularity, convergence is linear. So this is actually the, 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 the tools, you know, behind this are, are quite difficult, but once, once it's all established, uh, it's pretty easy to, to um, verify all of the conditions that you need for this. So this is a very abstract setting that allows you quickly to, to establish the convergence and things like that uh, for your setting. Um, so this would also then describe what's going on here in your, in your first semester numerical analysis class. Um, we, in all, for all practical purposes, uh, AX equals B, if you look at it as a feasibility problem, um, it's, it corresponds more realistically to an inconsistent feasibility problem. Because here's the thing. We usually, we usually assume that um, we, we have a deterministic operator sends us to a point plus error. The perspective here is, no, I have, I have a bunch of random operators that I evaluate exactly. And then where do I go? And that's, that's the, the shift in, in thinking about this. And that, that would explain, now I can tell my students, yes, this is what's going on. So uh, this is the conclusion. I've, I've already talked about this. Happy birthday, Alfredo, thanks. Yeah.